Okay, uh, good, good evening everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us uh, for the uh, Audio Engineering Society meeting for April. Um, before I introduce uh, our main speaker for this evening, uh, Steve Lincoln-Smith, um, uh, I'm going to introduce Alec Graham, uh, who's uh, going to give us um, a short briefing, uh, five to ten minutes, on a recent update uh, to the ANSI Infocom audio coverage uniformity standard for the AV industry, um, which he's been intimately involved with recently. So I'll hand it over to Alec. Hello, good evening. Um, uh, before the main event, I'd just like to uh, give you a quick overview of some work uh, Avixa, uh, formerly known as uh, Infocom, uh, have been doing over the last few years on audio standards. Um, Avixa is uh, the AV Industry uh, Trade Association uh, based in the US, but it's a, a global organisation. Uh, it's got offices in uh, around 60 countries and um, uh, has a few main activities. Uh, it runs uh, some uh, trade shows around the, the world, including uh, ISE, the Integrated Sy Systems Europe uh, in Amsterdam, also Infocom in the US, and uh, uh, in the Integrate Expo here in Australia, and, and a number of other uh, regional expos around the, the world. Um, they also uh, have a certification and training program, um, which is the includes the Certified Technology Specialist credentials and um, uh, a, a range of online and face-to-face -face, uh, training courses uh, related specifically to the AV industry. Um, and uh, in recent years, since 2009, uh, VIXAs, or at, at that stage they were still called Infocom, um, have started releasing some industry standards. Uh, so uh, there's eight uh, all up that are published standards now. Um, many of these relate to, to uh, video display sizes and uh, contrast ratio and so forth. Um, but there's a suite of audio standards as well. Um, the audio coverage uniformity standard, which is the one I'll be speaking about, uh, spectral balance and also dynamic range standards. Um, the, the latter two uh, are still in progress, so they're to be released um, within the next, next uh, 6 to 18 months. Um, but the ACU standard uh, was the first one to uh, be released in 2009, and uh, it's just come up for its um, renewal. Uh, allow me to uh, get forward a couple of slides here. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, the the purpose, I guess, behind all the audio suite standards um, is is sort of the fundamental root of uh, a lot of what we try to achieve, of course, in uh, in live sound. Is uh, is it is it loud enough? Can everybody hear? And uh, can everyone understand? And uh, w will it feed back? Uh, of course, um, the the purpose of the standard is really to create a um, an objective evaluation uh, of this this very subjective topic. Um, so uh, uh, the process to um, put together a, a, a to to review a standard uh, was first published, as I said, in two thousand and nine. After five years, it's been been due for a review. Um, so uh, a task. A group was gathered from uh, various places around the world, representing uh, manufacturers, uh, integrators, and um, consultants, among others, um, uh, to try and get a, a good overview of the, the industry. Um, I, re I represent a, um, uh, an AV integrator here in Australia, so um, that's that's how I became involved. Um, and uh, yeah, the first task was, I guess, to, to determine if we we're going to review, um, revise, or just withdraw the standard. Um, and if we're to review it um, or revise it, what to change and, and why. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, the purpose of the standard being, of course, to, to assess uh, a, an area, an enclosed listener area was the previous standard. The, the new standard uh, is broadened to be any, any listener area, so it can include open-air venues uh, like stadiums as well. Um, uh, and... Uh, I won't, I won't go too much into any of the actual detail of the standard. We don't really have time for that, but I just wanted to introduce it. Um, some of the things we, we changed in the, the revision were um, uh, the process by which we, we took measurements. Um, originally, uh, it was a, a time-blind measurement process using an RTA or something like that at a number of locations throughout the listener area. 
Um, this was updated to uh, a, a time windowed uh, response to to um, to simplify the measurement process and also uh, do away with uh, a lot of the effect of reverb colouring the the results. Um, uh, and uh, one of the other changes we made was original standard had only a pass or fail. Uh, as a result of the the testing, um, the new standard has uh, uh, six L5 classifications depending on the envelope, whether it's anywhere from 3 dB to over 12 dB from the, the lowest uh, point of audio coverage to the, the loudest. Um, there's, there's plenty of detail I, I won't get into. Um, the standards here, if anyone's interested in taking a look, um, it talks separately about our point source uh, sound systems and uh, distributed systems like our ceiling speakers. Um, and uh, it's applicable to, to meeting rooms, um, uh, concert halls, uh, stadiums and theatres, uh, really any, anywhere that um, sound is reproduced, indoor or outdoor. Um, and, and that's really um, about it. It is, um, you know, I won't go into all the detail about um, uh, the process itself, but um, hopefully perhaps later in the year when uh, uh, the field guide, which we're currently working on now, which is uh, kind of a case study and working through a case study about how to apply the, the standard, uh, once that's complete, um, I might have a chance to, to come back and tell you a bit more about that. Um, so uh, thanks for your time, uh, and uh, I'll uh, <laughs> pass on to uh, Paolo again. Oh, thanks very much for that, Alec. I think uh, just uh, scratched the surface and tantalised uh, information there. So hopefully we will get to hear a little bit uh, more about that later in the year. Um, I just uh, I, I, I realised I hadn't introduced myself uh, for people who don't know me. I'm, my name's Paolo Minolato. I'm the vice chair. Uh, of the AES in Melbourne, so I apologise for just making an assumption that everyone knows me, of course. <laughs> um, but I'd like to uh, introduce our main speaker um, this evening, uh, Steve Lincoln-Smith, who's the MD of Innovation Music Australia, um, to talk to us uh, about um, the merits of USB, Firewire and the growth of IP Ethernet base systems in pro audio. Um, Steve has uh, an extensive background having worked for Yamaha for many years. Was it 27? 26? Okay. <laughs> um, and, and all in the high-tech products area through that. So I think he is very well placed to give us uh, this talk this evening. He's brought along quite a, a number of products um, to review and um, look forward to learning more about uh, um, uh, this aspect and, and the software that goes on behind. So please uh, join me to welcome Steve. Now we're going to play how stretchy is the cable. Oh, that do. that's fine. Okay, so look, I, I basically have decided that that's good. So uh, thanks you for listening to me. I hope I won't bore you too much. Um, I've been doing this for quite a few years. And uh, this, this one's a bit interesting. We'll have some fun. Um, the whole point is I bought some toys along um, from one of my brands, which is RME, and then some Focusrite. And then we can talk about these little chestnuts as well. These are quite interesting. And our friends from Steinberg. By the way, Steinberg's owned by Yamaha Corporation. Don't know whether you know that. Um, they make a nice product. The drivers are interesting. So let's, let's just talk about what it actually is. Um, the topic for today, now you're going to have to excuse that. I, that, I worked on that for at least 15 minutes. <laughs> format wars. After 20 years of struggling to contend with the emergence of many new format manufacturers, began to realise they had to adapt and embrace these formats to survive. Hence, we've got this little beast, which is my absolute favourite, and I, I make no bones about that, and it tries to be everything for everybody. Then we've got our friends at Focusrite, and they've got a number of different ports and different varieties, um, and they're all trading on the fact that they're red. Because red is better, we all know that. And if it wasn't for Rupert creating a whole bunch of red series many years ago, um, we would never have that colour. It's like the Ferrari red. Anybody watch the Formula One last night? 
Well, when you see it live, the, the car go past, it's one red. When you see it through the lens of a camera on your plasma TV <laughs> screen or your high def, it's a totally different red. So it's all designed. It's like this. It all has to look fabulous under studio lights. Then these two here, very interesting. We can talk about the various merits of these because these do some quite interesting things. But I'll come to it. You know, sort of, you've just brought them in and handed them to me, but I know a bit about them, so we'll talk about that. So, format wars. Now, we all know a bit about what the formats are out there. You've got that poor little pest, USB 1. Give that some thought, USB 1. Then we've got USB 2, USB 3. Wait for it, there's another one coming soon. Don't worry. And that's very important, actually, for us. Thunderbolt, followed by Firewire. They're in no particular order. And the question is going to be for anybody in the audio business, whether we be engineers, salesmen. I'm sorry, I am a salesman. I did do an engineering degree, but selling's where I landed. Is it better to buy an audio interface that connects to my computer by USB, Fireway, Firewire, Dante, or Thunderbolt? And which one's still going to be usable in five to ten years? We want to spend it once. We don't want to spend it twice. Think about format wars in the video world. Who had a Sony 5850 editor? Hmm. Me. Yeah, what do you do with it now? It's a doorstop. It's big, it's heavy. Was VHS the better format or beta? Beta. 8-track cassette or mini disc? You know, like, both were bad. That's just, that's not, forget I said that. So, you know, ATRAC has a lot to answer for. It's why most of our children are deaf. So let's go back to this. Is it better to buy an audio interface that connects to my computer by USB, Firewire, Dante, Thunderbolt? There's a couple of other formats as well, but that, that's, that, let's just deal with those. And we want it to last. So that's the, that's the big question, I suppose. As far as I'm concerned, it's all about bandwidth. The copper connection, such that it is, is a copper connection. It's how the protocol interfaces with that connection and what we do with it. So, it's not about how many bits, not really. It's not necessarily about the sampling rate. It is, if you, if, you know, 24 bit, 96K, 192, 384, 768, of course. But it all boils down to, it's about, it's about the bandwidth and what we do with it. So before we dive into that, I'm not going to read this, but that's probably too much. It's more, more Star Wars. I was going to do that for the, for the whole night, but... My wife took one look at it and went, yeah, no, nah, don't do that. So before we dive into the details, it's worth noting the good news. Despite the various generations of Firewire, USB, and Thunderbolt, um, and they're on all sorts of products, they're all backwardly compatible. And uh, that's so they can be included in the latest standards. Most Firewire 400 devices can operate on an 800 port with the right connection. We know that with an adapter, you can connect Thunderbolt ports as well. But the devil's in the detail. Who's a Mac user? Great. How many adapters do you have on your, on your Lightning or Thunderbolt port to do things? Oh, I need to go to this. Well, that's great. I need to go to that. I need to go to this. And all you do is increase the latency and what you have to do with the product uh, by adding yet another little circuit or Apple, making you buy another powered adapter of some description. Um, great marketing. Great marketing. On well, the subject of great marketing, how many people, and for the younger folks, I'm sorry, have bought the same 70s album in four formats? I had it on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> then I had it on cassette because I needed it in the car. Then I, I had it on CD. And now we have it on, well, it sounds terrible. I downloaded it and it's, it's an MP horrible. Well, unfortunately, that's what, that's what um, Apple tried to avoid us doing because they just think, no, You've got to keep buying the latest product with the new port. Um, so similarly to most USB 1 and 2 devices can function quite well on a USB 3 port. <coughs> but the devil's in the detail, and I'll come back to that. So if we think about USB 1, poor old USB 1, 12 megabits per second. Couldn't really do very much. Um, USB was... Um, what did I, I have a friend in Germany who's the head engineer for this company. Uh, John knows him. I've spoken to him. Um, but Matthias used to call it, you know, sort of just totally interruptible serial bus because it never worked the way he thought it should. And we, we struggled for ages. And at RME, we did not make a USB interface until we got 
USB 2. If we look at USB 2 by comparison, 480 megabits. Ah, now we can start to do some things. Now we can start to actually get bandwidth. It's not about speed, it's about bandwidth. If you take nothing away from what I'm talking about tonight, bandwidth is the key. So in the theoretical world, a maximum USB 2 bandwidth, 480 as we said, you'd be able to record just over 40 tracks, 24-bit, 96k audio, while halving the sample rate to 48k would give you 80 tracks, theoretically. Theoretically. But then we'd have to do, start dealing with the fun stuff like controller chips. Are they made by Agia? Are they made by Rico? <laughs> Are they made by Intel? Are they made by <clears throat> Happy Chinese Audio Company? If, well, I had to be nice. I have other words. Normally I say Ning Nong Liu Audio, but I get into trouble for that. But if you're a Goon fan, that's perfect. So many of the manufacturers of USB 2 interfaces cater for higher sampling rates include 96K, 192, 384. But these always eat into your bandwidth. Bandwidth, the key word again. Every time you double the sample rate, you double the amount of data. We all know that. You know, 10 meg per stereo minutes where we start. <coughs> then we start adding to that. So in practice, manufacturers will tend to either offer fewer but higher quality A to D, D to A's. In other words, mic pre's and stuff like that. And that's what these guys do. You know, we've got two, two, and four. Wow. Right, but this is, there's a reason for that. We are trying to make the consumer, their experience at the higher sample rates, always work within a 480 megabit bandwidth. That's why the manufacturer does it. And also it meets a price point because there's not, a, not as many electronics in there, to be totally honest. So, so while it's true to say the bandwidth of USB 2 does present its limitations, it's probably fair to say that most home studio users these days, you know, don't really find it limiting at all. I've got four mics. Can you imagine some of the kids that learn here? What do I do with four mics? I've just got my guitar and, if you know what I mean, you know, mixing any more than that would be a learning curve. So, and there's lots of people out there doing it. There's, there's, there's our friends here and, you know, sort of basically, yes, I'm Focusrite Australia. I'm RME Australia. I'm Audient as well. I, I have three or four brands that I, that I look after. Um, so the, the, there's a range of USB product to cater for, firstly, price point and number of mic pre's that people want. You know, sort of like the, the, there's an eight channel there with um, inputs on the back. There's the, the range of twos and the four one we, we've got there. And in the RME world, you'll remember that one, John. Very, very nice. It's got a totally different approach. It's actually quite minimalist. It has two mic pre's and they're very, very good. <coughs> and that's the way they make sure that we can actually always ensure that there's enough bandwidth to do things. Is this making sense? Of course, you can get other versions here where we can have... We'll come to what, what that strange port is in a minute. So we've got you know, USB in a different format. This is, this is a more upmarket USB device, still current, nothing wrong with USB 2 at all. But of course, if you're a Mac user, you would have, everybody would have loved that. Firewire. And is it 10 years ago, 12 years ago? Or is it 15 that it came out? We thought we'd arrived. We thought we had it together, 400 megabits. So Firewire 400's not as fast, bad word, not as much bandwidth as USB 2. And yet, they, and this is probably why you'll find this format has vanished, will vanish, or has vanished uh, from most PC units, and we're stuck with putting a card. So, so basically, IRE 1394, IREE 1394, never quite reached the same levels of adoption on PCs as what it is on Mac, we know that. And the direct support on the motherboards is it's almost gone. When was the last time you bought a motherboard with Firewire on it? Nah, Itchy Dragon Computers still has them. And I'm not bashing Itchy Dragon Computers in Doncaster. You're still scratching to make them work because they're old, so sorry. <coughs> um, so, in recent years, which meaning users of Firewire interfaces acquiring a new desktop machine have to fit a third-party card. Devil's in the detail. What's the controller chip in the third-party card? It's going to be PCIe. Ah, more latency because we have to do a bridge on the PCIe bus to get it to actually put the information out. So we have another process to worry about, which, for the latency spotters, is the error. Okay, when it comes to bandwidth, Firewire 400, IRE 1394A, 
is slightly worse on paper than USB 2. Okay, 480 versus 400, as we know. The second generation of FireWire, which was FireWire 800, 1394B, had a totally different. It had a, um, a nice different port completely. Had double the bandwidth. It's around for a number of years, and we're now seeing that move away to USB 3. Now, the only FireWire 800 interface that actually worked at 800 megabits per second was the uh, RME Fireface 800. And it was quite famous for that, and we ran that one for 12 years before we retired it and came out with a RME Fireface 800 Mark II. But there was a reason for that, and I'll talk about the use of the FPGA chip uh, that is the heart of how all these, to some extent, work, and why this company has got it better than, than the others. I represent the, this as well, but this has got it better, and I'll explain why. So, do I talk too quickly? No. Good. So, of course, pretty pictures. There we go. A firewire unit. And what we've done at RME is, um, I've been with RME since day one. I was their first distributor. I rang them up in my best schoolboy German. You know, good that I'm in my inheritance. Get Stefan. Und. I want to be your distributor, to which they said, uh, yes, and I'd written it all out. I'd written it all out of my schoolboy German, and they let me get to the end of the presentation, to which Matthias, who's now my good friend, said, yeah, good presentation. You know we speak English. <laughs> <laughs> Sehr gut. Yeah, really good. So now RME, who are my close friends, we, we have both ports. And we have lots of products with both USB 2 and Firewire 400. In fact, the driver performance at USB 2 is absolutely stunning, and it's not because it's got 80 more megabits to play with in the bandwidth. It is because of how it's written, and this thing called an FPGA, which we'll talk about. Um, I'm on cue. What, what I'm supposed to talk about? Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Because I can be like that science teacher from high school. If you can sidetrack me, <laughs> I'll go all the way over there. Um, my son calls it, Dad, you've squirreled again. You know, uh, right, right on key, right on message, squirrel. So I've got to keep on message, hence I love PowerPoint. So there's our, there's our RME device. There's USB ports all over it and uh, FireWire 400, nice A to Ds, D to As. The AKM um, A to D and D to A converters are rather nice. And uh, it's very smart. And the active TFT screen on the right means that we can actually monitor everything in real time. So it's very smart for those sorts of things. But it's only one. Now... Things start to get really good. USB 3, 5 gigabits of bandwidth. What can we do with that? Now, with poor little old USB at um, 480, we get lots of two-channel interfaces. And you might get six channels. Or 18 channels for the stuff on the back. Which is all rather fabulous. When you start talking USB 3, that's 60 channels between the, the analog and the digitals. And we have another product, which is USB 3, which is called a Maddie Face XT, which will do 128 in and 128 out with next to low latency, no latency, um, and uh, because we've got 5 gigabits of bandwidth to play with. So it means that suddenly USB 3 becomes where you can actually have all your A to D converters and your D to A converters and any sort of computer that is running USB 3 that's it's, it's not necessarily about the processor, because it's not about the speed of the processor, it's about the bandwidth, to record the data. So we, we sell them as logging recorders, we sell them as concert recorders, um, playback recorders. Uh, playback in terms of the overture for a show, or there's a bunch of tours that we have out um, who would have 64 channels or 128 channels coming up from the fader so that the engineer does the mix of the room without the band being there. And plays, and plays the backing tracks and stuff like that. It's really smart, and it's rock solid night after night after night. Five gigabits of bandwidth. All right, according to specifications, I've already talked about that. It's really good. Um, they, they're telling us it's five gigabits, but we can get down to 3.2, but that's still 10 times faster than USB 2. It's 10 times faster. Um, another potential benefit of USB 3 is that uh, its ports can be made available for bus-powered devices. Um, USB 2, you've got um, a paltry, uh, what is it, 900 milliamp? I think I, I, yeah, 500 milliamp, sorry. Which means you can't bus-power anything. Now, 
that becomes a real problem if you've got a clunky little laptop that's not delivering enough power. And then the inverter, which is a black art for most audio companies, because if you get a microphone that pulls 48 volts and you turn the phantom power on, yep, no, the inverter does work, but there's no overhead. And you'll find that sometimes um, I, I've had situations where some of the cheaper interfaces put a shops microphone into it. Uh, no, just not enough to make it work. There's not enough voltage actually there. And it's not because it's a bad product. It's purely and simply that you have 500 milliamps and you're trying to turn that into 400, uh, 48 volts, which is difficult. USB 3, 900 milliamps. Good, we've got a better chance of actually um, doing more. So this should, in theory, allow manufacturers to develop bus-powered interfaces with more facilities for more channels. So in other words, you'll be able to get an 8-channel phantom-powered unit running on USB properly, or a 16. That's another limitation of why we produce things like this, because we didn't have enough voltage to actually get the mic pre's with phantom to actually work. So it just wasn't enough. And you were stuck with an extra wall wart. So everything can come down one cable, which is half the battle. Wall warts are the bane of our existence. Have a look at what we're doing tonight. One, two, three. Yeah, bane of our existence. It should all be bus powered properly. Okay. There we have that product I was just talking about. So that will give you, um, you're familiar with MADI, Mass Audio Digital Interface. It's an AES spec. You probably all know that better than I. So we have analog out as you're monitoring. And we have MIDI ports here, MADI ports, I should say, MADI and MADI, which basically means each one is 64 channels. So three lots of 64 in, three lots of 64 out, all at once. Um, it's, if you have a look at that screen, um, you definitely need your glasses. As you can see, you've got one, two, three, four. So you've got inputs and outputs of 64 channels, all viewable on the main screen. And it's a half rack unit, just to make it more fun for you. But particularly nice product. Um, runs off 15 volts at the end because of the, we, we can't pull enough out of USB 3 even to run this amount of channels. It still needs power supply. Just can't pull enough out of it. But that's the, the product there. Um, backwardly compatible USB port for doing that. So, interesting. But again, even with USB 3, the devil's in the detail. It's not a standard that's everywhere as yet. That's why, how many USB 3 interfaces other than the RMEs do you know of? I think it's zip at the moment. Most manufacturers have stopped two, and there's some reasons for that. Uh, here we go. Now this is taken directly from my good friend Matthias. If you've ever read the RME website, Matthias believes there's nothing um, grey in the world. It either works or it doesn't. So USB 3 compatibility is still a minefield out there for anybody who's building a system or wants to do something. You buy the right computer with the right chipset, winner. By the wrong computer, oh dear. So Intel, because they wrote the standard, perfect, not a problem. But you won't find a, a USB on, on some computers if there's an internal cable and it's not directly soldered to the motherboard, you get some transmission errors because of impedance mismatch and things like that, it loses some things. But in the main, Intel implementation, good. We like that. In the bad, AMD, same sort of thing. There's an AMD implementation of USB 3, which is pretty darn good as well. So you can have an expensive or, or a cheaper option with the computer you may use. Um, NEC, um, it's pretty good. Matthias is happy with that. And Fresco, not a problem. In Fresco, you'll find in some Mac products. Um, Via, even a Via chipset. And they used to be the enemy. What doesn't work is AS Media, Etron, and Texas Instruments. Surprise, surprise. Texas Instruments obviously is, 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 is not sticking to the standard the same way. They, they have a habit of reinventing things. Um, in one of the Mac models a few years ago, uh, the Texas Instrument controller chip, we could not make it work so long as our backside pointed to the ground at RME. We just couldn't make it. We couldn't actually get it because it was sending out a signal constantly. And the signal was things like, are you there? Yes, I am. So it was a, a docking handshake protocol. Are you there? Yeah, I said I was. Well, will you pass the audio? Because no. I'm seeing if you're there. So we never got past 
that first point. So we had a whole product that was called a five, five, five phase UC, and on certain Mac models we couldn't make it work at all. And that was all because of a change in Texas Instrument um, and how they implemented the information. Happily, that's the only ones we found that are wrong. Via and all the others, via Intel and AMD, all work beautifully well. But that's not the end of the story. There is hope. Ta da! 10 gigabits. Now we're really talking. 10 gigabits. What can we, what can we actually do with it? But do, do we know what um, Thunderbolt actually is? It's PCI Express with added plug and play on an external port. That's what the protocol actually is when you're writing to it, writing a driver for it or anything like that. Um, and because the manufacturers of audio cards and the PCs and the chip manufacturers, they've actually learnt from the problems of USB and Firewire and all that, we now have very strict quality control and certification. So it damn well works. Finally, we have a product where you can plug it in and we can say, yes, it works. Which is why a lot of manufacturers are moving to Thunderbolt in this format war thing. And Thunderbolt seems to be uh, to hold a lot for us. On the face of it, promise of great for audio applications. There are several interfaces that offer large I.O. and with DSP processing within, within that as well, which is great. There are affordable units. Um, folks right in particular have some quite economical Thunderbolt product as well. Um, but it means good, low latency product. Uh, and a lot of the same benefits as Firewire did in that through Thunderbolt you can daisy chain products, which is rather useful. So you have a multi-client driver where it has card one, card two, card three, for want of a better word, and you could have three fire faces. Each one's 60 channels, whatever, and you can do that. The only problem is the buses don't transfer. You can see it, but you'll have a complete 60 channels with a stereo output, 60 channels with a stereo output, 60 channels with a stereo output, but you can get around that by just uh, daisy linking um, your AES-CBU or SPDIF. You're allowed to say SPDIF to you guys? Who stole the format? Sorry. So, in practice, it didn't always work so well with Firewire because of the limited bandwidth. And we've got 10, 10 gigabits. Um, so there's much more with Thunderbolt, so it makes audio devices much, much more appealing and we can get the cost down. Um, so modern laptops, it just means you don't need an adapter. This is this whole, this is my pet thing at the moment. Adapters are the, are the scourge, are the enemy. Um, it's purely a commercial thing and convenience. Anybody had to do RCM certification on an adapter? Do you know what RCM is? Mm. Horrible. It's a, it's a new government standard. It replaces CTIC. CTIC was this toothless tiger, and then you've got RCM, which means that it's the same, only with electrical safety stuck in it as well. No test report, no sell. So, and of course, how do you tell that to a Chinese manufacturer? But we make a wall wart with your angle plugs. Yes, good. Have you tested it? Huh? Why? And of course, all of that is, you remember all those hoverboards and all those things that uh, blew up those, those couple of Christmases ago because the power adapter? It's, 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 a, it's a valid standard. So therefore, <laughs> I have to pay to get tests done. And it costs me an absolute fortune. So, the more things I can get that don't require an adapter, that are powered off the bus, is a good news story. So, you know, folks right have made this one. This is a lightning interface. It's basically one of these type of thing with a lightning port on it, which is great. Um, and then, of course, we actually have these sorts of products, which is our uh, folks right 16 Pre. And what that will allow you to do is it runs a, a multitude of formats. Optical in, optical out, two lots of Thunderbolt, because it'll link together, and the dreaded DigiDesign ports. And that's a whole other world of hell, because um, you've got mini DigiLink and full-size DigiLink. Um, but these copper, copper connection standards, and then a protocol attached to it, quite interesting. Let me start to deal with this. This is the, the Swiss Army knife of, of things. It does Dante, which is your audio over, over an, uh, you know, sort of, um, an IP type protocol. It will do optical in terms of ADAT. It'll do our Thunderbolt. Uh, it will do DigiDesign format. 
and then you've got bunches of analog ins and outs and some monitoring. So it's a real, it's a real smart device. If you need something in the RME world that does that, uh, that's that product there, which you're all welcome to have a good look at a little bit later. But um, that there allows us to do real-time recording while being on USB 3 or Thunderbolt, uh, run a complete remote system on a separate USB port, have um, you know sort of four mic pre's on the front, plus eight in, eight out, and then two lots of ADA in and out, plus 64 channels of MADI in and out all at the same time, and all that will run on a USB 3 port. All, on, all at once. Not a problem. So it's pretty, pretty important. So if we take nothing from what I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm not that school teacher, but this is, this is the important part of, of part one of what I'm talking about. That's what it looks like if we start to look at where the formats actually land these days. Now, PCI 2, up the top here, PCI E 2, 16 times and 8 times, are still magnificently fabulous, and that's why we still have internal cards on the PCI bus for a lot of critical applications for film composers and stuff like that. We still do that. Convenience is the external box, but because of the great bandwidth. Thunderbolt 3, still a mystery. Thunderbolt 2 is out there. Thunderbolt 3 is still a bit flaky. But it's promising 40 gigabits. Then we start looking at Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 1. That's what we, that's what we know works. This one, we're, Intel has just ratified that standard to some extent. Then we start dealing with USB 3.1. And then we start coming down to USB 2, all the way down here. Firewire. So Firewire, which was hey, that's the standard to have, is um, number two. And then all the way down the bottom, USB 1.1, and a P measly 1.2. So that gives you an idea. But that's not the whole story. That's, that's what the formats do. Now, um, theoretically, that's what all these, interfa all these interfaces should be absolutely great and all work pra practically brilliant, and they should all work. Would you agree? No. No. Because as I said, the devil's in the details. So what really makes a difference to the audio interfaces? Um, I can tell you now, it's not the format. The format is a convenience. It's what we do when we're getting to that format. Okay. FPGA as a mixer and a controller chip. This is interesting. Do we know what an FPGA is? Field programmable gate array. It's we'll call it a DSP if you don't want to get too far into it. But what it means is this: all the problems we have interfacing this group of this group of interfaces, this one, this one, this one, is because they have a controller chip which the company buys. It's a third-party controller chip. It'll be made by someone. Okay. Um, this is probably this is probably a dice TC dice chip where you've got an A to D, D to A, and everything on one chip, thanks very much. And that's what it does. And all you do, um, engineering consists of, I'm going to connect this pin, this pin, and this pin, and that'll get that port, that port, and USB, and we're ready. Uh, so it's an all-in-one solution. But, there's probably a controller chip within, the, there's, a dice, there's a controller chip within the dice chip, there's a controller section, and it might be compatible with some things. Um, there's, a, there's a chip set out there called a gear, Run away, be very afraid, be very afraid. It, it perhaps is not the right chipset for you to choose. But as audio engineers and users and musicians, do you want to be on the bleeding edge, the cutting edge, or you just want the damn thing to work so you can get the job done? And this is the problem. Um, my, I've got two guys who run the tech support and helplines for us. And we've got to the point where it's, hmm... 99.99% of our, our, our inquiries are, what did you do to your computer? What have you got it hooked up to? And we can make it work. But it would be easier if we could actually jump in and change the controller chip. Of course you can't. Or can you? So the FPGA can be the mixer. And it, we create virtual controller chips. And this is the, the, the benefit of RME. I'm, I'm in RME. Tell you why it's different mode at the moment. So the FPGA is particularly fun. So we use the Xilinx. It's Xilinx 6 or 7, depending on the model we're using at the moment. Um, it's quite a common off-the-shelf shelf chip, and we have it doing a number of things. Firstly, we realise the complete mix engine and DSP in this chip. Plus, 
the ADAC ports, and a virtual controller chip. So we've heard about USB 1, 2, 3. What if it was a USB 4? Remember the opening statement? We want to have something that works in 10 years. What if there was a USB 4? Well, we don't know what it's going to look like. We know it'll probably have more bandwidth. And there might be a separate controller chip. Oh, darn. My box doesn't work anymore. And we looked at that at RME, and we looked at that for the simple reason with the horrible experience of the Fireface UC not working on a certain Mac because Mac went and changed their controller chip. So, with a virtual controller chip, we can rewrite the virtual controller to take advantage of the new technology or what has changed. So that's the first point. So that's what we say a virtual controller. It pretends to be. But of course, if you're writing your own controller to interface, you can get the performance much better. So therefore, your latencies go down. So that's one of the advantages of a static EEPROM chip. Okay? You can flash it, but you can't really do much with it. Um, but you can flash new firmware and upgrade all the features and fix bugs. Total Mix is our mix engine, which I can show you a little later. But it does everything on the, in the box, in this one chip. So one chip is doing all of it. It does the controller, it does the mix engine, it does the DSP. It actually generates clock. Keep that word clock. I'm not, I'm not time watching. Uh, how long do I have, by the way? 45. God, what am I going to talk about? Keep going. Uh, so, so clock is what it's all about. Clock, clock is the most important thing. So if you can take all the processing off the CPU, off the computer, and do it all in the chip that's, con that's running the controller, that's running the clock, everything should, one, sync up perfectly, two, your latency starts to drop. This becomes really important. So you can do real-time monitor mix that are not going through the hardware of the computer, not through the computer at all. It's real-time. We monitor through the computer, but real-time monitoring in the box. So it becomes very useful. Okay, and we talked about off, off the shelf. Uh, yeah, picture of a Xilinx. Absolute bugger to solder back on. Absolutely hate doing that work. The glasses are too thick, and with the heat gun, no. I'm still doing them, but absolute pain in the butt. Um, but we can fix it. Drivers. If we've got our own controller, woohoo, we can write drivers that actually work. It's not, ah, we need to make a driver for Happy Dragon computer and audio card. Ah, it's close, but it still is not written for the product. It's one of the reasons why you got into the Macintosh world, because conceivably years ago when there were a, a Motorola chipset, um, I've got some bad news about Apple too, um, they wrote a system that was in your own eco world and there was nobody else playing with the drivers, therefore they wrote and it worked. And then they went and did a deal with Intel and their boards, some of them are made by MSI. Um, MSI is a Taiwanese company and um, it doesn't really matter. MSI is only one of their manufacturers. And if you've noticed that you get a Mac one week and it's got this board in it and you go buy one two months later and it's like, ooh, it's a bit different. It's all, it all looks the same, but the board and sides changed. Or the components have changed because they've saved, they've saved two cents on this and 20 cents on that and five cents on that. And they've rewritten the drivers to make that work. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, let's see, Apple announced that in 2020 or 21, they're now going to be making their own processors again. Rots a ruck. <laughs> it's, so um, there won't be Intel uh, Apple product anymore. They've, they've, um, they've, they've taken their, their mobile product, where they've got an A5 or an A6 or A7 in, in these things, and they're going to spin out that type of technology into laptops and desktops. And they'll run on iOS. Oh, I hope not. Oh, I can imagine right, doing audio application. Oh, yes, Mum. You don't want to dial Mum while, while recording something. I'm sorry. But that sort of stuff. So, of course, at RME, what we do is we have a long history of fast and responsive drivers, and responsive driver writing. There was a project I was doing for the Australian military. Um, it's old, I can tell you what it is. Uh, so, so what that basically meant is that, are you familiar with FM? FM? So you've got a carrier and a modulator. Okay. So we send out a carrier wave, and then we have a modulator. 
And if we think about how uh, in what's called net-centric warfare um, you communicate, well, it can be quite interesting. Uh, let's deal with, deal with a couple. A transmission through the air, that can be picked up. Fax, picked up. Radio, picked up. HFC, whatever, whatever you want to do, picked up. So what do we use? Well, we could encode in an FM signal, put a low-frequency carrier wave, and then modulate it ever so slowly and piggyback the data within the modulator. Really smart. So if we are completely sample accurate and we're dealing from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and we're completely sample accurate with our driver and our audio product and we split it up over multiple channels, you can do ship to submarine underwater communications via FM. And the US and the Australian do that, maybe do that. The only problem is... Um, they, they chose my product after I helped them put it together because it's a half rack unit and there was no space on the Collins class to get anything bigger. We shouldn't t and you shouldn't say Collins class very in because it's a bit of a failure. But that part works. So so basically it's 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 critical. Now we we were, we were doing that and we were, talking, we were dealing with one of the scientists at the DSTO Defence Force Science and Technology Organisation down here at Fisherman's Bend. Ever been to that place? That's really fun. Leave your phone, leave your wallet, don't have any USB sticks, get patted down, um, get through the door, um, don't see anything. Great. What do you mean? You don't see anything and you're taken off into a situation room, which is not the real one. Um, and that's where you would have your interview with, 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 with one of the scientists who's working on whatever project. So I got a phone call. Uh, your driver's bung. What do you mean the driver's not working? In the audio world, nobody found a problem. It was all good. It's a product we've been running for four years. Anyway, the responsiveness and being able to write for a situation of what this company offers is what it's all about. So they, uh, I called up Germany and spoke to one of the guys. Really, send me the information. The next morning, I had a new driver, and the one sample that was out of place was corrected, and the military was very happy. So much so that we sold it to uh, the British Navy in Scarpa Flow and the Americans have bought the same system. So it actually works really, really well. So responsiveness, and the part of the responsiveness is that we're writing to our own controllers and our own chips. It's, 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 a, it's a Xilinx, but they know the code so well. So it's rock-solid drivers. Um, if you want a driver for Windows 3.1, I hope you don't. We still have them. Um, the Linux drivers um, are, are, are quite good as well because we had to develop those for military. So, so that's really important uh, for whatever version of um, military Linux we run here. So we had to do that. Um, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Simulator. That runs RME. It's, it's rather fun. Uh, that was an interesting job. Um, and when you land at Tullamarine, there's a SODAR system. SODAR, sound and ranging, not um, radio and ranging. And so we, what we do is we fire a pulse and then um, a shift in pitch and time of whatever the pulse is reflected on, um, we can work out um, dimensions of an aircraft, um, atmosphere, and things like that. Um, and when, when another scientist came to me with that, I went, hmm, shift in pitch and time. I'm a musician. That's Doppler. That's a Leslie. That's a home organ. I know what that is. <laughs> Perfect. It's Doppler. I got it. <laughs> so, so you get the idea that they're very responsive. So they have drivers going back to God knows what. And... When they do that, they now have a combined driver, which basically means write once, fix all, because it's a common core in every product. Anyway, this is what I want to talk about. Clock. Um, we have a thing called steady clock. Um, there's many ways to generate a clock. Phase lock loop clock, piece of crystal, apply voltage to it, get it to oscillate. Oscillates at 88.2. Funny about that, quartz oscillates at 88.2. And we halve that through a divider circuit, 44.1, winner. We know what that is. Well, that's not, not exactly accurate, because have you ever seen all the rectification to get that clock to actually be 44.1 uh, after, after that in terms of the circuit? It's horrible. And then there's, there's various companies, have you ever seen some of these amazing American units that have this whole unit here, and then the power supply to try and get the clock clean. Well, we don't do that. We have a digital oscillator that is generated in software within the FPGA as well. And if you tell it it's 44.1, it is. 
So it works on a single stage detection for those sorts of things. Steady clock has the ability to extract the clock signal from other devices and clean it up. It's, it's useful for that. So what makes it different to all the others is right formats, right clock. Because if you've got the clock right, you're halfway there with digital audio. All right. Um, uh, yes, that's just, yeah, sorry. That's just different clocks. It can be, we can take the clock out of SPDF, AES, ADAT, or MADI, or whatever. Um, it needs to be extracted from the data stream. It's usually 3 to 4 megahertz, the clock that we're actually using to, get, to find out what um, sample rate clock it is. Um, and then most times in a digital audio clock, it has to be multiplied out for various uses. We were saying it's a crystal's one way, or there is an embedded clock in, in a device in terms of an external clock situation. Um, lots of errors in clocks, the old clocks. Wow and flutter, anybody remember that? You supposedly you don't get it anymore in modern devices. I beg to differ. I think we call it jitter, sort of. And jitter is audible, and jitter is annoying. Um, so you get flutter, frequency modulation distortion, and then we get new digital errors, which can be quite interesting, everything from RF and frequency modulation, as I said, which comes back to wow and flutter again, uh, which, which we hear, you know, recognise as jitter. So what we do, a bit of fun. Uh, some stuff from an oscilloscope here. So we have the incoming waveform at the top here. So the, the waveform's coming in. And what we can do is we shift it and then auto correct it. And all the jitter is taken away because we push the jitter out of the audible range. So we clean the clock allows us to clean up the jitter. Clock is so important. Rock solid clock cleans it up. So, you know, basically you take the trigger point and you move it to the left. So it's, it's really smart. Um, you can see what happens there if you look at this waveform. I just dragged a few out. Um, and also then you can start to see where your aliases are. What happens when you take a peak and then where your alias points are right through without, with a clock, with a good clock and with a bad clock. So, you know, you can measure it quite easily. And this company allows you to see their measurements. It's no secret and you can do this on a crow anytime you like just to see what's happening. happening. So... There's methods to remove jitter. Yeah, face lock loop clock. A low pass filter. Ooh, great. Um, RF jilter, jitter. Um, and anything below 20 kilohertz, you still get. So what does jitter mean to you as, a, as an audio engineer? Um, it's that thing, you've got absolute left and absolute right, and then you've got a signal with jitter where it's... It's not, uh, It was Greek Easter, so I needed to do that, sorry. Greek Easter on Sunday? Nobody's orthodox? Oh, sorry, didn't get it? Okay. <laughs> I've been working on this for a week. <laughs> so you've got, basically you've got absolute left, absolute right. Or you're the other way around for you. And with Jitter, your field perception is narrowed. And it gets murky in the middle. Then your mid-frequencies, the part where there's intelligibility, starts to become more difficult. So if you don't have an accurate clock... You're not, you're, not, you're not cooking with gas. You're actually only hearing half the picture. Um, it doesn't matter about the format. It's about the clock. Format's important. It's convenient. Clock. So, you know, sort of like you could use various ways, talking about standard quartz clocks and digit control frequency generators. Um, let's see. Uh, there's one, one from East Europe. It's got, this, it's got the frequency in a big blue dial on the front. Um, there used to be the Big Ben. Then there was the aardvark, and then aardvark became this other... It's, it's like a strange animal name. It's gone out of my head. Antelope, that's it. So antelope make this, this whole clock. But it's a digital oscillator with all this fixing around it and a power supply like this. RME do it inside the FPGA, thanks very much, and it's more accurate. Um, yeah, DDS synthesizers. I'll come back to that. Our solution. So basically... It's running at 200 megahertz. It's a digital PLL phase lock loop. So we're using a traditional circle, but we re circuit, but we realize it in, in the digital realm within the FPGA. And this becomes really important. 30 dB reduction at 2.4K so that we can actually remove the jitter out of the audible range. Very important. Um, you can actually see you can actually see jitter. I don't want to go into too much of this. 
I'm not avoiding it, I'm just saying, eh, we could spend quite a lot of time talking about it. But if you move, you can actually see the jitter move and change depending on what we're doing. That's just a typical example. That's the best example I, I have. You know, sort of like incoming, move it, and it's gone. And you, you're welcome to put that on a crow and do the same test anytime you like. It actually works. Okay, so steady clock, efficient solution, reduces jitter. Now, if you look at the A to D converters within more format wars, wars um, A to D converters. How many A to D converter companies are there that make chips? Well, Uli Beringer's managed to buy one of them, Usens. Um, but he, he's got one that, that he's doing things with. And um, then you've got AKM, you've got Burr Brown, and um, you've got quite uh, two or three others. And that's about it. Crystal Semiconductor. Um, hmm? Mm -hmm. So you've got a few converter chips. And manufacturers buy the converter chip. And then it's... You can look at them and you go, why does that device that's running USB 2 and within its ecosystem and, and its driver and everything sound like that, and it runs the same A to D converter as another device that runs in a, in a, in a, different, uh, a different ecosystem with a better clock, if you get all the clocks to line up, and that comes down to um, the actual physics of how long the clock line is to drive the A to D converters. If they're, like, in, in circuit board terms, all the way from there to there, that's ridiculous. It's got to be, you know, sort of nanometers. And therefore, if you get the clock accurate and you get the delivery of the clock accurate and at the same length to each A to D converter, things are better put in sync. So that's, 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 that's important. All right, enough from me. What would you like to have a look at? Ah, oh, quiet. Did I talk too much again? Does that make sense? Get in there, wake up. Thank you. I've got to put that over the other side. So this is this is typical. Um, will that will that do its thing? Oh. No. Oh well. Because it's a scalable bitmap, it will do that for me. This is the the blue box on the front there, and this is our FPGA at work. All of this is in the FPGA. But there's, there's much more. We can have a look at this and say, okay, let's just have a look. Uh, channel 1, EQ. So there's a, there's a, the, you know, a three-band parametric EQ on any channel, on any input, any output, any bus. It's really, really smart. Then we've got DSP. And that's all the way over here. We can shorten it, but just to give you an idea. Um, then we can look at all the usual things. But all this goes on in the Sorry, we'll just put the dynamics as well. All this happens within the FPGA. And this is the difference between these things. Um, devices like this, pass audio, good. Nothing wrong with that. But there's probably jitter in it, there's probably all sorts of things, and there's probably USB one or two. Two. More than adequate for the job, so. it, job it's designed for. Same as this. That's two USB two. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it's fine. But what's the clock? It's a piece of crystal in this, for sure. Um, because, uh, what's his name? Takna Kata is the designer of this product. And he's been doing it the same way for a very, very long time. These guys, these, these guys have just started to get into FPGA. And this product, you know, that's a $129 interface, you know, like, we're not talking sheep stations. That does a very good job. That's a $4,000 interface. You know, we're not comparing apples with apples. That's 4000 bucks and has all the different... You know, sort of uh, bells and whistles on it. So you get the idea that we've got compression, we've got EQ, we've got dynamics on every input and every output, as well as the clock, um, as well as a complete recording facility as well, because it actually uh, records at the same time. So it has a USB 2 port on the front where you can put a drive and or uh, a USB stick, um, and it records um, straight to it. And then that becomes a... Uh, a self-expanding archive, which we could drop onto the desktop and then put all 64 channels, if, if it was a MADI stream, uh, onto the desktop. So it's a, it's a logging recorder. But just to give you an idea, 
of what you could actually do in terms of this. Um, let's see, for the latency spotters, what have I got down the bottom here? Hmm, it's my mouse. Oh, there you are. Hello. Good. No way. So I can pull up the... Um, Okay. Now please remember I'm actually running this on a horrible little surface. This is the a little surface 3. You know, it's not about the speed of the computer. It's about just this is just a, a, a picture. So this is what RME was famous for. Dump 32 samples. You can run all of those channels at 32 samples, which is really smart. And then it comes down to the speed of your hard drive and whether you can actually present the data back to it, necessarily, not necessarily anything else. So, so basically, you can see we've got different formats. Um, it, uh, it, of course, it's built by a bunch of engineers. So we have USB error diagnostics that sit within the driver to tell you about dropouts all the way through. Um, they're, they're quite nerdy. Um, there's, they actually don't work in an office. The two guys who actually write this is uh, Martin and Uwe Kirst. See, Uwe? They're absolutely brilliant men. Um, they live up in a place uh, called Schleswig-Holstein, and they don't come to the office because the office is in a place called Midweider. And, and they don't, and, you know, like Germany's not a big place. It is, but, it, it, you know, but it's all telecommuting and they all work in teams on the, the, but via, via the net. So it's, it's rather smart. Anyway, that's what I wanted to natter about. Anything I can t talk to you about, or have you had enough of me? Just... Uh... Okay, fine. Great. It's look, it's in the ALSA format. Um, there are a few little tricks to it, but basically we have a mixed control panel and we have drivers uh, and we you can address it very almost like a Windows type driver because it's been written. Um, Brendan Woith W O I T H E from Adelaide Theatre Company. Uh, did the drivers for me. RME did not write them, we had them written here so that I could um, do the military contracts. So it's an Australian thing, Brendan can keep updating them, he's in Adelaide and it's it's in the ELSA format. Do you know what I mean by ELSA of course? Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't support Pulse Audio. Hmm? doesn't support Pulse Audio on you? I'm not sure. Okay. Not sure. But um, basically we have them for all the Fireface product and all the PCIe cards. Uh, so they're they're working fine. Yes, sir. Steve. All the interfaces that you've talked about now, the interfacing methods, have all been serially based. Mm -hmm. They're talking to machines at either end that handle information in parallel in chunks of thirty-two or sixty-four. Correct. Bits. That's why we have two USB modes. Uh -huh. um, we have an isynchronous mode. I've forgotten the name of the other one. It's gone out of my head at the moment. But we have two USB protocols. One uh, is in serial chunks, and the other is to use multiple data lines within the USB format. Which is what I was getting to, because <clears throat> with ever-increasing data rates, your connector is going to become more and more a transmission line. Yeah. And you also have the problem of converting in the interface chip from... 64-bit word mm -hmm. to 64 bits in a row and then unconverting at the other end. Sure. Which involves latency. Correct. So therefore, if you had uh, you take the DSP away from the computer and you also have some latency compensation algorithms, which we do, which allows you to present all the data um, to your ears at the same time. Because your, your real-time monitoring is here. So that's what you've got coming. And then we can, um, from a stage, and what you've got coming, coming off a hard drive. And there's real-time latency monitoring compensation between the two. So we can overcome that, but I see, I know what you mean. That's why we have two USB um, transmission formats. Forgotten the other one. There's a synchronous, and I can't remember what the other one is, but we have a flip-flop in the driver to actually do that. Let me have to look and see if I can see it. Um. <laughs> you, you, you come down to Maddie and it's a serial, a single stream serially modulated with the data. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, apart from the old parallel 
thick bunch of cables. Uh, I don't think there's a, a any not really. Oh, well, well Digi, 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 DigiLink um, is a serial form of communication from, from um, what's it called, um, the Pro Tools and, and Avid. That's in that, that, that's a serial communication. Um, if we look at, um, there were some things which, which use cables that look like old null modem cables, a, a cross cable, 25 pin. It was like a, like a Centronics almost. Um, but they've vanished. They've gone the way of the Dota uh, at this time. So everything we have, except for um, a PCIe card, which will give us 16 lanes, and that's why that has so much promise still, because the computer can present the information properly. And that's why we still sell PCIe cards. Remember, this is a convenient format. This is convenience. Um, PCIe um, offers you better bandwidth at less money and does multiples. This is the old MBN argument. So whether we have fibre to the home... Where, how did you get to that? Whether we have the fibre <laughs> direct to the home or whether we still rely on copper. Because at some time, in the, past, the amount of copper that you'll be able to use, the maximum length of copper, is just going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. That's why we have fibre at um, HFC. Hybrid no, we don't. Yeah, yeah, we do. We, well, MBN thought they had, they jumped off this and now they're thinking about health we're abandoning so, HFC, not much good, but... Never should have gone there. The, the, yeah. The, 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 there is a point that says, in optics, for example, if you want to get a higher data rate, what they do now is they have optical multiplex and we use a large number of carriers modulated at a small data, smaller data rate than having one carrier with a very high data rate. In the, in the audio world, um, over optical, it's called SMUX. Yes. And we do that sort of stuff. So, so, But we do that within um, just audio transmission um, on a fiber optic, like, like ADAT. We can SMUX that. We, actually SMUX, we can also SMUX with um, the optical MADI format as well um, to, to, to you know, get over the same things where we have multiple MADI ports. To, to with uh, part of the data here, part of the data registered there, part there, part there. Yes. And you've got to synchro have your cable all the same length, precisely. No to latency. Latency. No compensation. latency compensation when the data is reassembled mm. at each end. Yeah. However, in terms of domestically available formats, mm. serial is where we're at today. Yeah. Doesn't matter which one. You know, you look at Dante, the IP stuff. Okay, that's a serial communication as well. Okay, and and basically it's it's the same thing, and and, and effectively you have um, groups of channels which are assigned to cables. If you wish, you can do it that way, or they can all be assigned down one Cat six E cable. You know, it just depends on what you want. Um, the greatest problem of that is is it, it's going in packets, and then there's an, a reassembly job at each end to be done, and it's that's a whole other can of worms, and I ran out of time to, to actually prepare something on that, but that's a whole other can of worms. That is the fashion format right now, and it's very good. Dante. When there are over 5,000 Dante manufacturers. So People when, using it. When's the UDX coming? UDX? UFX was for fire, uh, hmm. Firewire. UDX for Dante. Next week, if you were to come to Frankfurt, I could talk to you about that. <laughs> Sorry. If you come to the, <laughs> the, the, the um, Frankfurt Music Messer with me, you'd probably see one. And AVB, let's not go there. That one frightens me. Because half the music industry wants AVB because they want it. They don't know what it is, but they want it. And then the other people want Dante. And then you have everybody going, but this, this is what people understand. This works. It's two, four, six, eight, 24 channels affordable. Anyway. Another question? Yeah. yeah. So I'm a proud uh, RME user, by the way. Um, how do you see RME stacking up in terms of design against Apogee and UA? And the second question is, I actually use my, my RME uh, in the class compliant mode with an iPad, mm -hmm. which you can do through the camera kit. Yep. Uh, even if it doesn't have the lightning interface, how do you see the, the, the emergency, emergence <laughs> of the, uh, the uh, tablet-based uh, digital? Uh, okay. Well, let's, let's deal with the other, other products at the moment. Apogee? Nice product. Can't say anything bad about it, but um, it's another FPGA-based product, but they're 
five to ten years behind where these guys are because these guys started first. Nice product. Can't say anything bad about it. However, their FireWire 800 interface never worked. It was always FireWire 400 on an 800, with an 800 port, and it only ever ran at 400 because they could never uh, work out how to get that together. Um, Universal Audio? Wow, great marketing company. Wonderful marketing company. Um, the more you load the front end up with plugins, the more you will have some latency issues. So th th their future is um, some form of processor hosting in the box mm -hmm. so that they can actually run those great plugins. Interestingly, the managing director of Universal Audio bought a MATI card from me when I was working in the US um, because that was the way he could test things with the lowest latency possible. Where's RME going? Well, this is good. There are new products to be released at Frankfurt this year. Class compliant mode is working exceptionally well. Um, one of the new things that is happening is we are delving into IP control um, and that's being released. So, so basically, um, because this is actually a full digital mixer, you've got EQ, you've got compression, you've got inputs, you've got outputs, you've got monitoring. So it's actually a digital mixer as well as being an audio card. So what we've done is we've created Fireface Remote, which is not Total Mix. It's an IP remote system. And if you use, hang on, I knew I'd get off on a tangent. Doing a squirrel again. Yeah, you ever heard of this company called Bohm? No. This is nice. Bohm is, Florian Bohm's a little guy. He's out of Munich. This is the most useful little box for audio and MIDI. So it's a Wi-Fi hub, as well as Cat6 in and out. So it does audio and MIDI over IP, as well as puts it out on Wi-Fi uh, with USB, and does MIDI. And it is it is the ideal thing if you wanted. Say you wanted to run this as a digital mixer on a, in a stage setup. So you put this in the rack, put that there, connect it. It assigns an IP address to here, um, and then an IP address to your iPad. And then you stand in the middle of the room and mix. Um, that's, that's the new release, the first new release we're doing. Um, iPad has become more important. Um, class compliant mode, it's quite good. Um, it's, uh, it, but having to run a camera kit, painful. However, um, it is just a copper connection, basically. Um, and, and, you know, sort of like, how would you like to be the person that bought the expensive headphones to use with your Apple device? It's the same thing. It doesn't have a headphone socket anymore. You know, some of those sorts of things. It's plenty useless. And you've got to buy this adapter cable to run your expensive headphones. So it's common practice, unfortunately, with those sorts of things. However, um, the RME is very mindful that there are many different formats out there, and hence that's what we're talking about. We know USB 1's dead. USB 2 is still the most affordable. USB 3 has some quirks. You've got to have the right chipset in your computer. Um, Thunderbolt shows, and Lightning, shows the absolute most potential by virtue of the size of the bandwidth. It's the most potential to do things to get over the serial problems for what we're talking about. There's enough bandwidth that it doesn't really matter. Who's going to do 60 channels of audio, 80 channels of audio? How many of us are going to do that? Yeah, I do it for demonstration, to be smart. But, and, and this might be some outside broadcast work that happens with that. Um, and that's, you know, sort of, we've just finished uh, three outside broadcast trucks with Sony where we've supplied a whole bunch of equipment and they needed multiple channels to do things. And this is the only game in town. Yes. Um, and, and IP audio, um, the fact that we actually have uh, Dante on various units uh, to do things was, was seen to be the most logical way to go for them. But it's a copper connection. And the, and the idea is that we're always going to have to have some form of format change to make it work. It's more about what's in the box, and then how we get in and out is somewhat secondary, as long as the bandwidth is there. Make sense? Cool. God, I even answered the question. And in English, I'm doing well. Any other questions? The Thunderbolt product. Mm. There's actually a brand, Thunderbolt, isn't it? They've got a product out, the interface. No so idea. Thunderbolt? Yes. Yeah, Made by Ning Nong Liu Audio or a main company? Because <laughs> anyway, I designed a whole bunch of stuff for JB Hi-Fi. I'm sorry, it was my fault. I called it Icon. 
there's many brands called Icon. And design was the loosest word I could possibly use. I got a unit, I got the diagram of what the chip did, and I really did say, we don't want that feature, that feature, no, don't want that, don't want that. So what do we want? We want input, output, gain, thanks, and a USB port. Can you make it look, in a plastic housing, it looks like that? Make it red. Why? Oh, I think it'll look good in red. That was, that's called engineering. That's called box engineering. And it sold, it sold thousands of the darn things. Um, but... Um, you know, sort of like it could be another one of those, or it could be something really, really good. I, I have never heard of it, so I don't know. Do a Google on it, you'll see it. No, I've got no idea, but I will. It's one I don't know about. Okay. Oh, well. Questions, Scott? Thanks very much for listening. I actually have another oh, another one? Sure. So we didn't really cover the analog front end side of things, but um, the question is on the RAV. It's a high Z for instruments, but I found it. It's nowhere near, uh, it is actually very good, but it's not, not as good as if you have a DI. And um, my yeah. conclusion was that the cost of embedding an expensive DI into a product that is supposed to be more cheaper is uh, That was Matthias's idea. And you would, you'd be better to go into one of the combi jacks. You've got uh, plus four minus 70 to play with. And you could actually do a very good job with that. And forget about the, the high Z input, don't worry about it. Uh, you'd be better to go straight in the combi jack. You've got plus four, minus minus seventy uh, on this product. So you got you got Most plenty of, of things. Would seem to be trained in the same way because they look at the forums. Everybody talks says, "Yeah, invest in a DI and then go to the interface." Yeah, you have much better Yeah, you will. You would. I, I agree. I agree completely. But so I got a Rupert Neve from the guys at A Wave and like blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Uh, Thanks Commissioner for listening. Steve, uh, I just want to say that uh, one of the things that I was thinking about through that was uh, the famous line from the Castro ad that, that said, oils ain't oils. And I think none more the case where, where you go through all the different types of formats of connectors and their performance limitations, and then cover their chips aspect of it and their performance limitations and then the clocks. So it really is uh, a case that... Um, you know, they're all very much unique, and you need to know uh, the products that you do you and do. the specification. The, well, the greatest problem for me, as the, the representative in Australia, mm. is it, 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 it's best explained by a joke. What's the difference between a used car salesman and a digital audio salesman? The used car salesman actually knows he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> and that's enough. <laughs> so join with me as Hank Kelsey. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Hank.